Tijan Tiem has probably the most unusual background of any of our speakers today. He was a cabinet minister in Ivory Coast until the government there was overthrown in a military coup. He went to France as a partner with McKinsey before coming to the insurance industry in this country, first with Aviva and then Prudential, where he's been chief executive for the last four years. He's chairman of the Association of British Insurers. We welcome Tijan Tiem. Thank you, Simon, and, and good morning. It's a real privilege for me to, to be here today and to address this audience. Uh, what I would like to do is first to, to focus on the changing shape of the world, then the role that British business can play in this new world, and finally, talking from a perspective of a company, Prudential, that is active in Asia, the US, and in the UK, share with you some of our experience. As the Chancellor mentioned, there are clear and encouraging signs of recovery in the UK. He is also right to say, in the same breath, that there is no room for complacency. We should continue to work hard to ensure that we enjoy a sustained and lasting recovery. We in British industry have an important role to play in helping to secure improved prosperity for the country. And in my opinion, one of the important ways we can do this is first by understanding the realities of a changing global economic landscape, and second, and more importantly, by positioning ourselves to make the most of the opportunities available around the world. I would argue that one of the most important trends that has been playing out over recent decades is the shifting of global economic weight from the west and north to the east and south. And this is likely to continue long in the future. Our company, Prudential, has long experience of operating in Asia, and I would like to share with you some of the lessons we have drawn from our experience, as they may be relevant to some of you as you try to get a foothold in those markets or compete with companies, companies emerging from that part of the world. So put simply, growth in emerging economies is and has been outpacing growth in advanced economies. This has been happening for some time, but this evolution has now reached a point where I think I can fairly say that the world has changed. This year will be the first time since reliable records began when the emerging and developing economies combined will be bigger in absolute terms than the advanced economies. Recent market commentary, and the Chancellor alluded to that, highlights the risks of an emerging market's slowdown. But with one or even 2% slower growth in GDP, emerging markets will still be growing at a rate that far outpaces economic growth here in the West. Asia today produces 40% of global output, up from 10%, 10% in the 70s. Its middle class is larger than the whole population of Europe. I repeat, the Asian middle class is larger than the entire population of Europe. In 2011, for the first time, the Asia-Pacific region overtook North America in its number of millionaires, millionaires in dollars, and now has more than 3.6 million millionaires in dollars. And I'll tell you an anecdote here. Recently in Singapore, I was talking to a lady who sold the largest policy ever sold at Prudential, and it's a 10-year policy with an annual premium of $1 million. So we told her, well, that's very good, but you know, from here, where do you go? How are you going to improve on that? And she said, well, it's easy. I'll sell one to his wife next year. So that's, that's Asia. So the economic center of gravity of the world is uh, shifting and shifting to the east. What is happening now is possibly one of the most profound changes in the world economy since the one that took place during the Industrial Revolution uh, two centuries ago. So those numbers tell us where we are now. Others point to the future. In our business, the life insurance business, you learn very quickly that demographics are destiny. One of those demographic truths is that there is always a very close correlation between GDP growth or growth in the working population and economic growth. With recent immigration and rising birth rates, the UK 
may not be aging quite as dramatically as many developed countries, but the fastest growing demographic group in Europe today remains the over 85s. That is good news, but we need to provide for them. The median age in Europe is 41, whilst in Southeast Asia it is 27, and in Sub-Saharan Africa it is 18. Those are enormous differences. This means that in the EU, by 2030, there will be around 2.5 people of working age for every pensioner. So 2.5 people of working age for every pensioner. Now, what is that statistic in other parts of the world? I can tell you in Indonesia, which is one of our largest markets, the most populous country in Southeast Asia, there will be nearly six people of working age for every pensioner by 2030. And even more extraordinary, in Sub-Saharan Africa, there will be 15 working age people for every pensioner. So Asia, which is already home to 60% of the world's population, has on average a much younger population than the developed world. It is therefore no surprise that this is being called the Asian century. But looking at these figures, it's also clear that the changes I'm talking about go well beyond Asia. And I am happy to go on the record and say that the 22nd century will be the African century. And if I'm wrong, we can come back and discuss it then. If any country has a strong record of engaging with a changing world, it's Britain. Some Russian officials may regard Britain as just a small island that nobody pays attention to. And yes, Britain is home to only 1% of the world's population, but it is still the world's sixth largest economy, and there are good reasons for that. The city of London is the global capital of financial, professional, and legal services, and the UK leads the world in cross-border banking and international law firms and has Europe's largest asset management industry, and we're proud to count MNG within Prudential, which is the largest in the UK. So in my own industry, insurance, London is still the undisputed global capital. Insurance today employs 320,000 people in the UK. And beyond that, we're very active in programs like working for youth and apprenticeships, which are very important for the, the British youth. So Britain has many advantages that make it an ideal base for businesses seeking to address this new and changing world. Britain has a stable business environment, a supportive tax regime now, strong intellectual resources, and a well-trained workforce, with four of the world's top 10 educational institutions located here. And of course, it has a long tradition as a trading nation of supporting and benefiting from free trade with strong global networks built up over many decades. This is a very good place from which to take on the possibilities and opportunities of the changing world I just described. It explains why I, born in Africa, educated in France, with a career in Europe, Asia, the US and Africa, live here today. And let me be blunt about it. I am not sure that there are many other countries where someone who looks like me could be chairman of the National Insurance Companies Association. So all these advantages and all these achievements of Britain and of London don't mean that we are always as prepared as we should be for those new opportunities. There are great prospects for Western businesses in this new world, and we need to approach them in the right way. The experience of Prudential may offer some lessons here. You are all familiar with our name and our history. The company was founded just a few miles from here, literally, in the city of London, 165 years ago in 1848. And our company became a household name through our role in providing insurance for millions of British customers for world wars, depressions, booms, and recessions. But today we're quite different from that company created in 1848. We are still big in the UK, where we have seven million customers. But our main area of growth, as you know, is now in the dynamic economies of Southeast Asia. In Asia today, we have more than 13 million insurance customers, and more than 400,000 exclusive agents. So much so that when I go to Asia and I meet our agents, we have to rent a stadium for our meetings. We're selling our products, and around half of our agents are women, and that's an important statistic. After being supported for many years by the cash generated in the UK, last year, for the first time in our history, Asia was not only cash generative, it was actually the largest contributor of cash to our group and has started returning large amounts of cash to the UK, which allows us to pay tax for the Chancellor. And we are one of the top 10 taxpayers, I'm proud to say, in the, in the UK, thanks to that success. The man from the Pru, with his iconic trilby and briefcase, 
is now much more likely to be a woman in Southeast Asia with an iPad traveling around her local community on a motorbike and dealing with her customers in a, in a coffee shop. One of the lessons we have learned is that for an old organization like ours, the ability to keep things in perspective and to take a fresh look at issues is very often crucial. Throughout history, there's been a universal tendency for civilizations and nations and for businesses at the peak of their success to begin to assume that the world revolves around them. The Aztecs did it, the Chinese in their time did it, the Romans did it, plenty of businesses have done it. It is perhaps a natural human tendency to assume that if you are big or successful, the world must adjust to you rather than the other way around. This form of hubris often holds the seeds of downfall. While the Romans could have been forgiven for thinking that the world ended at the pillars of Hercules, with the information available to us today in the age of Google, Facebook, Twitter, and my children tell me Instagram, we do not have the same excuses as the Romans had for ignoring the rest of the world. The world is more interconnected today than ever before. And there is little excuse for not knowing what different customers in different parts of the world want and for adapting to that. When it comes to Asia, part of that necessary perspective is recognizing that Asia is not one single place. I've even been caught saying Asia doesn't really exist as a concept. This is an assumption that Asia is one, but I have seen made often, sometimes at surprisingly high levels. To succeed in the markets of Asia, as in any other, requires an understanding of the intricacies, the complexities, and the unique characteristics of each of these countries and markets. We are working across 13 different Asian markets, and that is something at Prudential that we know intimately. Each of these markets is fundamentally different, and it needs to be approached in a manner that is right for that specific market. This is quite natural in a business like ours because it's a people business. We sell through agents who are always nationals of each country where we operate, and our products are quite determined by the local cultural context. The way people want to be protected or deal with health risk in Indonesia is not the same as in Thailand or in Vietnam. And our takaful business in Malaysia, offering Sharia compliant or Islamic insurance products is one example of how we create products that are tailored really to each market and to the specific needs in that market. As I talk about that diversity of needs, which can sometimes be a constraint, but that I personally see as a huge opportunity, I would like to, to stop a second and say a few words about regulation, which is, rightly, a theme much discussed since the financial crisis. In recent years, regulators have quite rightly increased their focus on protecting customers, and this is something I strongly support. However, we have to make sure that in doing so, regulators do not try to enforce a one-size-fits-all approach across markets and across sectors. The search for transparency is vital, vital sorry, and should be applauded. The search for consistency in a world that is as vast and as diverse as the one we live in can be a recipe for commercial failure. So regulators might keep in mind, must keep in mind, that an international company like ours, and like many of yours, will not operate in Lansing, Michigan, in the same way as it does in cities like Hong Kong or Kuala Lumpur. And there is nothing wrong with that. It is, in my mind, the opposite that would be questionable and more likely to be wrong. Some worry that such an approach is inconsistent. We would see it as both pragmatic and effective. The important thing for us is that our values are consistent wherever we operate. We focus on the long term, we listen to our customers, and we offer them a good product at the right price. But the needs of our customers are not the same. The way they like to buy our products is not the same. We, for instance, in Asia, which is a highly technologically literate society, a strong preference for face-to-face -face contact. So a young family in Indonesia, in Indonesia, again, will buy its retirement products very differently from a young family in the UK. We have clear, strong central disciplines in certain areas, such as cash, risk management, and capital. But I do not set, and we do not set from London, our product suite in, ja in Jakarta, for instance. The search for consistency must not be allowed to stifle the ability of international businesses to meet the needs of their diverse customers and win in every local market. So Western countries must make sure that regulation, in the end, does not make it too difficult for Western companies to be successful around the world. Another lesson we've learned is that succeeding in those markets, particularly Asia, requires patience, a lot of patience. That means taking always a long-term approach 
and not be driven by short-term changes in the news. The changing view for, of the health of the Chinese economy is actually a good example of this. China's growth has indeed dipped from where it was a few years ago. This may be unsettling for some, but taking a long-term view should override any short-term concerns. Plus or minus a point of annual growth in Chinese GDP, frankly, that does not change the central fact that the scale of China's economic growth is transforming the shape of a global economy. Within the next 20 years, China may have surpassed the US as the world's largest economy. Asia overall is expected to add about 21 trillion US dollars of GDP over the next two decades. That is creating Germany six times over that period, equivalent of six Germanies. Even if the growth rate of Asia <coughs> for the whole period was one percentage point lower, which is a lot, it would still create five Germanies over the period. So we're debating whether Asia is going to add four, five, or six Germanies. It doesn't change the message. That is why we believe that taking a long-term perspective is a necessary condition for success in those emerging markets. What we have also learned at Prudential is that uh, the success of Asia can benefit usually the West and Western companies. The rise of the Asian consumer is a theme regularly talked about by economists and analysts as a significant driver of our future economic growth. In my view, it is the broader theme of the rapidly growing Asian middle classes that represents a great opportunity in the coming decades. In Asia, as I said earlier, 525 million people can currently count themselves as middle class. That is more than the total population of the European Union. And that number is expected to treble by 2020 to more than 1.5 billion. And the trebling in six or seven years sounds extraordinary, but those are the kind of dynamics we see in emerging markets again and again. At Prudential, we've been able to create significant value by designing products that meet both the savings needs and the protection needs of this large and fast-growing Asian middle class. And if I may quote here my, my CEO in Asia, his argument is that, that that pie grows faster than our ability to eat it, which is a very comfortable position to be. But there are many positive feedback loops to Western economies here. I'll just take two examples, but from two key reasons why the Asian middle class buys our product, and that are relevant for the UK economy. For instance, we, we, they often buy a prudential savings product, saving $20 a month or so, to be able 20 years down the road to send their children to a Western university. Well, with many of the world's best universities situated here in the UK, you can clearly see that the rise of that Asian middle class provides opportunities for this country. They also buy our protection products to have access to a modern health sector in their country. Pharmaceuticals and health services are another strength of the UK economy, and British firms are working hard to increase their market share in that sector in Asia and other parts of the world. I mention other parts of the world because there is a similar story starting to unfold in Africa, where GDP again has trebled in the last 10 years, and where a middle class is also growing rapidly. All that said, government has a crucial role to play here in ensuring that British businesses are best placed to capitalize on all these opportunities. We need to support free trade around the world. We need to ensure that we continue to develop the right kind of skills. And we need to foster and deepen our connections with emerging markets everywhere. Finally, we need to remember that this is not a zero-sum game. We are not competing against the growing markets of the East and the South. As trade grows, as companies succeed, and as each part of the world plays its part in fostering growth, we have the opportunity to make our interconnected world more prosperous, safer, and better. So today, Asia is good news for us. Tomorrow, I believe Africa will also be good news for us. And as our experience shows, businesses in Britain can play a central part in both creating and benefiting from that global growth. As I mentioned at the beginning, this indeed looks like being the Asian century. I believe if we approach it in the right way, it can be our century too. Thank you. John, thank you, thank you very much indeed. Um, you talked about London as the global capital of the financial industry. Hasn't the European Commission threatened that uh, status? I mean, the Prudential was once reported as looking at possibly leaving London because of it. Isn't it a real threat to global companies like yours? 
Well, I'm sorry to say that it is, in a way. Uh, we, we have said many times on the record that uh, we, we love London, we're very happy to stay here, and that uh, it is only changes uh, in the environment or in the regulation that could, that could force us to, to live against our will. And I've got to say that Solvency 2 is not, um, and I'm quoting the, the UK regulator here, is not an example of how to make regulation. Uh, first of all, it started in 2002, that's a while ago, and it's still not implemented. The, the closest date we have is 2016, so that's 14 years of work. Um, it um, um, involved huge expense from the companies. We've collectively spent a very significant amounts of money on that, and, and some of its aspects are, um, I believe, dangerous for the economy, uh, encourage short-term, pro-cyclical, to use the jargon, uh, investment, uh, we would end up in a position where we wouldn't be able to finance any of you. We wouldn't be able to hold corporate bonds. We wouldn't be able to hold triple B paper. We wouldn't be able to invest in private equity. We wouldn't be able to invest in infrastructure. I, I just cannot understand how that is good for an economy like the European economy that needs growth, jobs, uh, employment. So, uh, I mean, we have made this case as an industry for, for a long time. I mean, the good news is that we've been heard. It took a lot of... Uh, a lot of effort, but I, I think we've been heard and, and things have moved in the, in the right direction. I have to say here that the regulator and the government have been extremely helpful and we've worked very closely. Just Monday morning, we had a, a meeting with the regulator of all the insurance CEOs to, 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 to talk about the final phases of negotiation in, in Brussels. So I'm much more optimistic than I've ever been. But um, my point is, this was all unnecessary. And whilst I'm doing that, my competitors are focusing, well, not Europe-based, on running their businesses and gaining market share. And that is the true cost. It's the opportunity cost that is really uh, the most damaging in that. Can, can I broaden the question slightly? I mean, you're, you're a French national as well. You have the Legion of Honor. I see it in your lapel. Um, are there, you worked in Paris for many years. Are there differences in the way Britain and France work in business terms that we should hmm. think about? I suspect you know the answer to that one. <laughs> <laughs> I would say yes. <laughs> um, well, well, where to start? How much time do we have? <laughs> no, there are many, many differences. Look, I, 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 um, hmm. I, from a French perspective, I think we have a lot to learn from, from, from the, the UK. Um, what do you say in English? That the most accomplished form of flattery is imitation. I think we're imitating you a lot. And a lot of us have voted with their feet, by, like me, by coming here attracted by the environment that the, the, UK, the UK offers. Actually, I think one of your most endearing characteristics is that you, you, you ask these types of questions. Um, I'll, I'll go on the record saying this is, generally when you say to a Frenchman that you, you love France, they are flattered. flattered. I said, oh yes, of course. <laughs> tell me why. And when you tell an, an Englishman that you really admire and love Britain, generally the reaction you, you get is, oh really, why? <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's a very endearing characteristic and long may it last because I think that as long as you have that attitude, you, you, you'll keep winning. That, that's a fascinating perspective. Um, let me ask another sort of broad question. You were a minister. You mm. ran a strong privatization mm. program when you were a minister. Mm. What are the strengths and weaknesses of government operations as opposed to the private sector? That's a, fascinating, that's a fascinating topic. Um, one of the clear weakness in government is there's no yardstick for performance. Um, in business, at the end of the day, profits for share price are very useful because they create a common language and they align people by, by definition, if you wish. Uh, in government, things are much more diffuse. Um, and also, um, how can I say this? You are accountable for a lot of things you don't control. So you often live a pretty miserable life. It's kind of, you know, all kind, in any country, all kinds of things go wrong every day, every day, I assure you. And fundamentally, when anything goes wrong, people look at you as in, you know, well, it's raining. What have you been doing? <laughs> well, yeah, well, we live in an equatorial country. It does rain a lot. <laughs> so no, I'm being facetious. But um, there, is, there is that. There is um, actually one thing that people believe, I think, which is not true, is that People work less hard in government. That is not my experience. I've, I've found a lot of very committed, very professional, very hardworking people in the public sector. And I, I often defend, I must say, in private sector meetings, the public sector, which I think is not as bad as the private sector um, things. Um, 
And um, increasingly, another big difference is that if you work in government now, with all the pressure on, on government revenue, et cetera, you, you have to be quite imaginative because you just have no money, mm -hmm. no money to spend. And that's, that's quite new for, for a lot of governments. And also, um, to be blunt, the, the freedom to hire and fire is much more limited. And it makes management more and more complicated. But, but frankly, I think both are interesting. And I personally advocate a movement between the two. I've got to say that's something America has got right. There's a lot of transfers, and it's beneficial. It's a win-win, because um, in government, you do learn a lot about, uh, about people and how, how to work without authority, how to influence, and how to achieve results through um, alliances. And in, in the private sector, you learn a lot about efficiency and, and teamwork, etc. and bringing the two together can, I think, be quite, um, quite powerful. You've had some storms and controversies at Prudential. But when you were a minister and your government was overthrown and you went back to Ivory Coast, you were actually arrested and, and detained. Your father, who was also in politics, spent several years in, in prison. We don't learn from generation to generation. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what perspective does that give you on ups and downs in business to have had those experiences as a politician? Hmm. Um. Well, what, to be kind of trite, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Because I, I, I'm, I'm, although I haven't been an entrepreneur right, in terms of career, I think I'm, I'm, as an individual, I'm quite entrepreneurial. And if you, if you take risks, you know, you will succeed and you will also fail. And you need to learn from the, from the failures. You, you referred to, I, I will say the word, to the AIA transaction, um, where we failed to buy for 35 billion a company that is now worth 58. Like, that's actually the most painful yeah. part of it. People tell me, well, you've been vindicated. You were right. What they don't see is that for me, I'd feel, I feel well, it's almost more painful because I failed at achieving something that would have been absolutely phenomenal. It makes the, the failure almost more, more cruel. So you have to learn from that. I, I, I think if I think of a company, uh, it was a collective trauma, a very traumatic moment. But I think since then, we've reacted I don't know if there are any shareholders in the room, but I think we've reacted in a way that has been positive for our shareholders. Um, and in the end, that's what, that's what matters, is how you react to, um, to, um, to those events. And it does help you to, to put things in, in perspective. And, and instead of focusing when something bad happens, on, on how terrible it is, try to focus more on, okay, what next, what do I do next, and how, how do I come back from this position? Tijani, Tim, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you.